Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey. And this time we are going to be recapping and talking about and analyzing and celebrating the European Championships 2024, which I have to say is one of the most exciting events that I've seen in figure skating in years. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I have seen a competition as well attended as exciting, as just well-produced overall as what Lithuania presented here for the European Championships in decades. That's not an exaggeration. Truly, truly magnificent job. Before we dive into it, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. This was the same weekend as Canadian Nationals. We're going to do a separate recap episode about that because the Europeans is just too much to cover. And Canadian Nationals vibe was just a very different thing from this. So I think they do really need to be separate from each other. If there's a big takeaway from this event, it is utter success of the Lithuanian Federation in putting on an incredible event. This was their first time doing a major ISU championship event. It will not be the last. Absolutely not. They should be pitching a world championship immediately. Maybe they need their own Grand Prix something because that was spectacular. The venue was wonderful. It was a gorgeous venue for this. The production value, super high. And then as the event went along and you got towards the free skates, the finals, and particularly some marquee events, and we'll start right off with those in a moment, the Lithuanian public came out in such a massive, supportive way. You had fifteen or 16,000 people in that venue for the ice dance final and for the gala. It was full to the rafters and just loud. It, the commentator, Chris Howard, was talking about how it sounded like a rock concert in there because it was so loud, both from the sound system and the crowd going crazy. This looked like what we want all skating events to look like. <laughs> exactly. Right? After several years of seeing figure skating drifting in its popularity, losing ground, losing audiences, having major events in places like the United States or Canada where the venues are just kind of empty feeling. This is the promise of what this sport could be. And the Lithuanian crowd and their organizers did an incredible job of making an event that made the skaters feel fantastic. You could tell that they were just feeling the energy from the crowd. There was looks of wonder on their faces at times because they were performing for the kind of audience that you dream about. That kind of leads us right into the dance competition, which really was the marquee event. Thanks to Lithuanian, I'd say, heroes at this point, <laughs> Allison Reed and Salius Amberlevicius. I've been talking about this team all season because I have been in love with their programs from the first time that we saw them this season. These are veteran skaters. You know, they've been around for a long time, but their material this year, their rhythm dance to Guns N' Roses, which is so close to my heart as, as a rock fan and somebody who grew up with GNR and just the vibe and how different it is, but their sublime free skate that is conceptually about how we are too involved in our phones and not in our relationships and not as interconnected as people anymore has really hit home for me. And I've talked a lot so far this season about how strong that program is and how it doesn't buckle under the weight of its concept. So I've been so pleased to see their success as this season has gone on. But even knowing that they were going to be skating on home ice, I had no idea the way the Lithuanian crowd would come out in support of them. And this is probably the most powerful bronze medal performance <laughs> that could possibly happen. It's just incredible. Yeah, this is way beyond like gold in my heart. This is unbelievable response to a bronze medal finish. And to be fair, this is their first podium finish at a European Championships. The European Championships are an enormous deal for European teams overall. So it should not be surprising that it would be exciting for the Lithuanian crowd to see. And he's literally from the town that the European Championships are happening in. Yeah, Kiwanis, Lithuania. Right. But I agree. It was the level of volume, the emotional response, the flags everywhere. It was just beautiful to see. And when they were leaving the ice from their free program, you could see almost like that shaking, the vibration of emotions coming off of both of them, the joy, but also the overwhelm. It just was amazing. But I also want to point out, 
both of their skates under enormous pressure were spectacular. They didn't just win the crowd by being hometown skaters. They put on a show and lived up to the expectations that I'm sure everyone in that crowd had for them. I don't think they missed a step. They were absolutely spot on the best I've ever seen them. Yeah, this is exactly what you would hope for. I mean, you could always hope for gold, but you know, of course, yeah. in this situation, they were going up against Gwynard and Fabry and Viren Gibson. And both those teams have been performing extraordinary this season. Nobody was expecting Reed and Amber Lificus to go for the top of the podium here, right? And in our preview episode, we lined this out where we expected this exact one, two, three. This is where we thought this was going to go, but just in such a phenomenal fashion that we never could have predicted. So for Reed and Amber Lificus here, they had to be going in thinking, okay, our shot is at bronze, but like you said, enormous pressure. And not for nothing, this ice dance competition was phenomenal. Absolutely. I mean, right behind them were teams that in other competitions absolutely could have not only medaled, but potentially won. But in ice dance, as we've talked about ad nauseum and everyone involved in skating knows, everything kind of moves at the speed of a glacier in terms of like moving up in the rankings. However, I think we saw a lot of teams kind of shuffling about here in this competition. This one was really interesting to me because the top 10 or 12 teams were all spectacular. There was a comment that we saw from somebody online that said, if Europeans is this good, Worlds is going to be a bloodbath in the ice dance competition because the level of competition is just so high. The people who are fighting for the top of the podium, the people who are fighting for those middle tiers, just this microcosm of it for the European division, there's just so much talent in here. There's so many great teams. We can't cover all of them and not have this episode go four hours. So <laughs> yes. we're going to have to concentrate on the top six and then a few other uh, mentions. It was just wild how good this was. And in particular, because I think that free skate was in front of such an electric crowd 15 or 16,000 people losing their minds. I felt like all of those teams skated up to that energy and deliver just an incredible final. So let's just swing this back around to the top and kind of talk through the top six with a couple of other little mentions here. We've been seeing this whole season, this kind of rivalry between Italy's Charlene Guinard and Marco Fabri and Great Britain's Lila Fear and Lewis Gibson. We've covered a lot of that, especially during the Grand Prix. What we can look at here is two teams that skated magnificently at this event. Maybe not quite as well as they did on the Grand Prix. There were a few little technical issues. Clearly, Fear and Gibson didn't hit those gigantic highs that they did at NHK Trophy when they had the upset win over Gwynard and Fabry. And also, Fear and Gibson had to follow the energy of the room and that sort of come down after Reed and Amber Livicus. There's a quote from the French team, La Pareve en Brassard, who ended up in fourth, who we'll talk about in a minute, where they said that they were so grateful that they skated before Reed and yeah. Amber Livicus because <laughs> they're like, how do you follow up the energy? How do you follow up a performance like that? And that really put Fear and Gibson in a tough spot afterwards, even though the crowd was so receptive to them. You could tell that they just didn't quite hit that energy level the same way. But then it's like the room settled down and then that really allowed Gwynard and Fabry to come out there and deliver their beautiful free skate. Yeah, I agree. I think Gwynard and Fabry benefited by having a beat, but their free skate, again, had a very tiny error from Marco, which is such an unusual move. Marco doesn't make mistakes. It was a blip. It was nothing and nowhere near enough to drop them down on the podium gorgeous program and i did see like a quote from charlene talking about the crowd as well coming out onto the ice for the free program and looking up and around and just being awed by how many people were there and how huge a moment this actually was for them so very very good and very expected results there these are still highlight reel performances oh, for yeah. both of the top two teams. It's just hard to look back at this and not remember Allison and Salius's performance as the marquee thing because it were, was. They were the stars. Right. But I do want to mention La Pareva and Brassad and fourth. They were fourth in the, in the rhythm dance and in the free. I thought their programs looked incredible here. 
Although apparently Chris, the commentator, did not agree, which was kind of entertaining for being the most positive guy throughout the entire competition. I feel like we found the one skating team that he didn't like. It yeah. was just kind of weird. <laughs> so La Pareva and Broussard have one of my favorite rhythm dances of this season. The music is well chosen. They're... It's just quirky, just like them. Right. Yeah. This team definitely brings a different vibe to the ice. And that's something that I always enjoy from them. I thought they were so precise at this one. Their performances were sharp, nuanced, lots of great details, lots of great character work, which is one of the things that they're so good at. Partic great acting. Yes. Particularly Yevgenia is just such a character on the ice. She's so expressive. But as a team, they definitely bring a certain level of quirk and character that is unique amongst most of the ice dancers. Overall, I really liked Chris Howard's broadcast of all of these events to go solo through so many hours of stuff. He's is, a beast just yeah. to do all of that. Yeah, but every time this team would skate, whether it was both their competition pieces or even the gala, he'd get done with them and be like, well, ice dance is subjective, isn't it? And I guess some things just leave you cold and I just don't like them. <laughs> and <laughs> He didn't directly say that. He would say, I just didn't feel anything. Did you feel anything? Like, it was almost like he was gaslighting the audience. Like, I didn't feel it. Did you feel it? You probably didn't feel it. And I was like, but I did. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it got done with their, their rhythm dance. And he says, oh, you know, that just leaves me cold. And he's like, and I think it left the audience cold, too. People are clapping and on screen. And he's just like, they obviously don't like it either. But then he spends the next three minutes talking about the great technical qualities yeah, and stuff. It, this is not to dog on Chris in any way. It was just sort of an odd mm, moment. I'm going to dog on Chris a little bit there. Just <laughs> and, and granted. This is subjective, right? I mean, people have called out before my reaction to not really liking Piper and Paul's programs this season, or there are some skaters you may just not like. I get that. But it's so weird to have a guy who was so supportive and so upbeat through everything. And then every time this team would come up, he would just go really cold. And well, in the exhibition, especially, I thought it was odd because whenever they're done, he doesn't say anything about them. He doesn't talk about them. Yeah, no, he it, just starts talking about the crowd and the event and the venue. And then he moves on to the next team. I'm like, why don't you like them? Yeah. Like, it feels personal at this point. Right. But on the flip side, if there was ever a Georgian skater on the ice, he would gush harder about them than anybody else out there, which was also noticeable and kind of unusual. So... I'm not really familiar with that guy as as a broadcaster. And overall, I enjoyed him and his idiosyncratic. Keen like, as mustard. Yeah. Yeah. Those, all those oddball things. <laughs> she never lost her nerve. All of that stuff. It's entertaining. It's funny. But yeah, those couple of things were sort of noticeable. But, you know, people will bring that up with Johnny and Tara where like Johnny will react very negatively to certain types of performances that just don't meet his personal taste. And. Anybody who does any kind of commentating, part of what you bring to that analysis is your own subjective taste. And it was just very clear that this guy could love everything except for the French team. But I don't care. I really like them. And I thought they were great here. I agree. But there was another French team worth talking about here, which is Dimanche and Lumassier. I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. This is kind of a surprise fifth placement here. They were eighth after the rhythm dance, which was really nice, but had a few little bit of issues in it. Their free skate was gorgeous. I was really impressed with this team overall. Yeah. Whenever they appear, you notice them. You're like, hmm, I should keep my eyes on them. But they have not really ranked very high internationally. Consistently top 10 overall in like higher level international ISU events. But especially when you have another French team that is sort of like your more marquee pair, like La Preva and Brousseau, they were kind of a little farther down. Here, I felt like they took a giant step forward. I agree. Their free dance was remarkable, very intricate, very unusual, not in a quirky way like La Preva and Brousseau are, more in this emotional way. I just really, really enjoyed it. And I felt like they stepped forward into their moment and are going to be more of a threat going forward. Yeah, a jump from eighth to fifth in ice dance is extremely noticeable. They got a seasons and personal best in that performance. And it was just so musical. It was like they were so well timed. They just hit the beats wonderfully. They had spectacular lifts. The choreography was great. Just everything about that performance from Dumage and Le Massier was just wonderful. This is the first time where they really grabbed my attention and said, this is a team to watch. So Absolutely. really pleased there. I think the one disappointment I had was the placement of Turquila and Versluz. 
They're your reigning 2023 European bronze medalists from Finland and have been remarkable this season. Their free dance may be my favorite free dance of the season overall. However, here they've got deductions in both the rhythm dance and the free dance that even seem to confuse them a bit. I really don't know where some of the issues that they were dinged on happened. There were no visible errors. I'll say their rhythm dance is not my favorite and them placing below the teams that they did in the rhythm dance didn't really surprise me that much. But their free dance is absolutely spectacular and they did a beautiful job here. So it was a little confounding. I would have more expected them to land in the fourth spot, if I'm being honest. But I still think they did remarkably well and being a top six finish here is still great. If I were them, I definitely want to talk to the judges and just understand what happened. Like, what did we do wrong that took us from third to sixth? I think their free skate is a masterpiece. Agreed. Of all of the free dances over this season, that's the one that always mesmerizes me. I'm so taken with the choreography. There's such presence to it. I just thought they were wildly underscored here. I agree that the rhythm dance doesn't suit them as well versus the just sheer artistry of the free skate, but they do get called on weird technical things sometimes where they get deductions that are very hard to parse. In this particular instance, I couldn't figure out if maybe it was a lift time violation, if maybe they'd gone over like the seven second rule or something. It was really hard to parse what that was, but they were clearly disappointed. I would have thought they would have done better. I can't really argue with the four, fifth, and sixth because I just really liked all those skates, and I don't know how I would quantify them technically to put one above the other, but that free skate is one of my absolute favorites of the season, and I do think that they were rewarded on a lower level there than they deserved. We should also mention that, to your point earlier about this whole competition being incredible all the way down, the seventh place team, Tashler of Tashler, fantastic performances in both rhythm dance and their free dance. I think their rhythm dance really just sold a little bit harder, which is why they dropped a little bit back into seventh. At the same time, incredible performers continuing to come into their own as a team for sure. I think they got taken apart a little bit in the review on their technical in their free skate, but they have just magnificent skating skills. I mean, they're deep, deep knees. They're just so invested in the story and the choreography, and they have that straight line lift, a beautiful thing to see in there. I have a lot of faith that this team is going to excel as the seasons go on. You know, what we see, especially in the quadrennial leading up to the next Olympics and stuff, there's a lot of jostling for position just to see who's going to be the next marquee names. And that team from the Czech Republic, I think, is definitely one of the ones to keep your eye on because I really enjoy their skating every time they're on the ice. And also ones to watch the other Czech team, uh, another sibling team of Matsakova and Matsik. They landed in ninth. Their material is not as good as they are. Yeah. Like they are exceptionally talented skaters that especially in their free dance, I sort of lost the thread of what they were trying to do about halfway through. And I mean, it's like a Swan Lake program. We've seen a lot of those. Theirs is a unique interpretation, and I do really like it. They did have an error or two as well in that dance, but it's more the choreography that in the last minute or so where I'm like, okay, this is starting to feel frantic and not cohesive. That said, incredible team, incredible skating skills, probably the fastest team out there. And I think as we go through the next few years towards the Olympics and really beyond, there are going to be names to watch. Overall, it was just the most exciting ice dance final that I've seen in a long time. Well, let's move on to the men's competition where we did not see an upset at the top of that podium with Adam Siohemfa coming back again. Maybe not in his most tip top form, but did plenty to absolutely earn that second European title. If you were just looking at the numbers and the placement here, It would be easy to say, okay, cool, good competition, but these numbers will not stand up on the world level. And that is a completely valid criticism here. Even Adam, who we have seen be spectacular and be over 300 this season, won this event with a 276.17. That's very soft if you look versus like the Japanese men and things like that. However, just in analyzing this particular program and not worrying so much about how this is going to compare further on the international stage, 
there was a lot of really strong highlights and some surprises, some places where there are performances from people that I would not have expected to have shown up as well as they did. With Adam here, what we saw was a little bit of a holdover from French nationals in the sense that he looked a little rough. He looked rested, but nervous going out there. I think there's a lot of pressure this competition. There were some shaky spots in his skates. There were definitely some jumps that did not look as good as they had before. Both of his programs, I thought you'd see him start scratchy and then accelerate into this sort of full form version of Adam by the end of it. He's still exceptional and exciting and wonderful on the ice, but these were definitely not his best performances, but they were far and away well enough to get him at the top of the podium here. Adam showed that he was sort of in a league of his own here, and he could have particularly his quad LUTs in both programs. He landed them, but neither one of those looked comfortable, I guess is the word I'd use. But in general, he was flawed, but still fantastic. I mean, he won the competition by 20-ish points, almost. Yeah, roughly, yeah. Um, he also, to be fair, lost two points because he decided, you know what? I'm going to throw the backflip in this competitive free skate because who cares? Which I've seen some very mixed reactions to online. I'll admit I loved it. I was just like, why the hell not? I mean, if he doesn't think he needs the points and he thinks he can do it safely, which he did because he does it all the time. I saw Benoit, his coach, say like, it's such an Adam thing to do. He just <laughs> sort of shook his head at it. Yeah, I enjoyed it for what it was. Adam has done this twice this season, where just in the middle of a competition, he's thrown the band element of the backflip. It does not have a value as an element. It actually has a deduct. It's a two point deduction for a band element. It does not disqualify you. I've seen people say that they're like, oh, if you throw a backflip, you're disqualified. That's not what it works. It's a deduction. I think people misinterpret the Surya Bonali event from back in the 90s yes. uh, where she she could throw the back foot that she could land on one foot um, so that it technically should have been able to count as a jump element. There's a lot to be said about that as a historical moment in skate and the repercussions of it. But I think what Adam is doing here by his own words, he's trying to push the sport a little bit to recognize that this particular element is not dangerous. Lots of skaters can throw the backflip and do it safely. What we've seen from Adam and from Ilya is a desire to push the sport as far as its technical and physical restraints. Adam going out and throwing that element is him saying, here's a thing I can do. The crowd loves it. And I don't care that you're going to ding me for it because I am such a strong performer and that in this moment I have the padding to do it. Yeah. And to be fair, it's not as dangerous for him. I'm not saying it isn't dangerous, period. But a lot of what they do it's is a dangerous. Very dangerous sport. I was like, have you watched pair skating? Right. <laughs> and I think that's really what it is. And I've seen a few people make the comment that it's not the backflip itself is as dangerous as it is perceived to be. It's that by having this band, they don't want to encourage more dangerous things like a full twisting backflip, which has been tried before and seriously hurt people. It's sort of like thinking of it as a gateway drug. Just because someone can do a backflip doesn't mean that they're going to do this other thing. You can also continue to have other band elements. It's a complicated conversation. I can see both sides. But for Adam, I'm here for it. I'm glad he had fun with it and the audience loved it. Yeah, my only concerns with it are one, I think backflips do tend to look a little sloppy. I think they're really fun and they're, they're big crowd pleasers, but I don't think they look particularly artistic in any way. And actually, my bigger concern is that I think that they just jack the ice up. I think that they just take such a hard hit, especially if they land on toe pick. You're potentially just putting ruts in the ice that could affect other people's skate if it's not Zambonied afterwards. I don't know if that's a real valid concern. You know, I'm not an ice skater, but I do wonder if that's an issue. But anyway, beyond all of that, Adam was still terrific here. But I think the bigger story out of this men's competition is the surprise second place finish from the Estonian skater, Alexander Selevko. I loved Alexander here, especially his short program. Yeah. It was its own artistic masterpiece, in my opinion. I thought it just looked unique and different. It was super well choreographed. And he just exploded with it. It was that wonderful moment of watching a skater have everything finally work for them. 
in the short, he was in third and there was a lot of conjecture till the free skate. Was he going to be able to maintain? And he did. To your point about scoring, I mean, he had close to a 257, which would not put him in the top six by any means at Worlds, but it sure would keep him in the mix overall. He's a talent to watch, and I hope that this is just sort of the start for him to, like, step into the scene a little bit more because he was a ton of fun and had his own very specific aesthetic that I really enjoyed. This is one of those cases where I think uh, Alexander typically goes by Sasha as, you know, his preferred name. So Sasha really put on gorgeous, committed skates here. You loved his his short program. I think between both the skates, but especially the free program, I think these were star making performances. These are the kinds of things that elevate somebody from a guy that's just from a smaller country that you don't often think about a lot on the big international stage to now somebody who you're going to want to watch, you're going to want to root for. And a lot of times the talk with him is that he and his brother are both competitive skaters and they were both here at Euros. His brother washed out and didn't make it into the free skate, whereas Alexander made it all the way to the silver, which is notably the first Estonian Euros men's medal. So a big deal for his country and for his federation along with him. And it was great to see his brother in the stands cheering him on in that free skate. And this guy, he's visually striking. His style is dynamic. I think there's a lot of room for growth. If he could get just maybe even one more quad, he could be really in contention. In the bronze medal position, I was thrilled to see Matteo Rizzo come through after not the best short program, having, in my opinion, the best free skate of the night. Mateo is nursing a pretty awful hip injury that he's going to have to get surgery for directly after this. He didn't even go to the exhibition gala at the end, but somehow muscled his way through that free skate. I don't know. He gave me feelings. Watching him almost made me cry. It really did have this beautiful, sentimental emotion to it. Mateo is a favorite of mine anyway, but this was just a lovely thing to see. And I loved his attitude through this whole competition. Like he fell in his short program. And whenever he was in the press area after it and they were asking him how he felt, he's like, I can only do what I can do. He knows he's nursing this injury. He just had this positive attitude. And he's like, you know, 10 points isn't that much to make up. I can still maybe make the podium. And then he did. Yeah, I think a lot of the talk about Italy's Matteo Rizzo going into this was, is there any expectation that he can succeed here because of that significant hip injury? And, you know, what we saw was a guy who was, you know, certainly fighting through some pain in places here and there, but also was just so grateful to be there. There's this beautiful moment right before the freak skate starts. Oh, that's right. Most of the time when people come out and they get ready to perform, you know, they put on game face, they get really serious or they make their character face or something. But Mateo got onto the ice, struck his position, and then for just a moment, this smile breaks out where you can just see that he is happy to be there. And all he wants is to enjoy this moment on this ice in front of an incredible crowd. And from there on out, he just delivers this just gorgeous skate. He has the crowd. The energy is lovely. He does it to cold place, fix you. It all just comes together. And by the end, he has won his moment. Again, we talk about the bronze skates coming through here. When this one got done, I was thinking, oh, that might be my favorite performance of this entire event. But the ice dance final hadn't happened yet, right? (laughs) So I didn't know what I was in for, but I was so swept away by it and I thought it was incredible. I love Mateo and I'm so happy for him. In fourth, a kind of a surprise here, and not that he hasn't been a competitive this season, he's had a very good season, but Gabriel Frangiapani, another Italian coming through, he was really close. I mean, he only was behind Mateo by about four points and some change. So amazing competition for him, his highest ranking at a European championship. I was very impressed with his artistic growth throughout this season. I feel like he's starting to create his own identity on the ice. But overall, his technical was very sound. He had some errors here and there, but at the same time, he showed strong consistency, strong skating skills, and just a lot more feeling in his performances. With Franchipani, this is a guy who has jumps, but they're not the highlight. That's not what the performance is about. He has beautiful deep edges. His footwork sequence was lovely. He brings a lot of drama to the performance. He got dinged on a couple of technical things. He had like a repeat element. So there were things that kind of brought his number down a little bit. 
but he still delivered really impressive performances. He was great in the gala as well. He's a guy that I watched and I was thinking, oh man, this might be somebody who would be a great move over to solo ice dance if that becomes a really notable thing eventually. But he does have the jump, so he's still competitive in that way. I really liked his artistry and I enjoyed his skates a lot here. Absolutely. On a more disappointing note, Lucas Bridgeke, who has had an incredible season, been super consistent, was second after the short with a very strong short program and just sort of fell apart in the long. It was a bummer. Him coming here, tons of pressure. He was a medalist last year. He knew that if he skated up to his potential, he would absolutely not only be on the podium, but could have even threatened Adam if he was perfect for that gold. But it just wasn't his day. When you went to the free skate, Lucas was the last skater. And after seeing Adam throw down a solid but inconsistent performance where he also threw the the backflip and took the deduction... With a 276, that was a pretty soft score. And Lucas could have, if he'd gotten up there and done a season's best, I think he was potentially in the running to take that gold. And I think it was a little too much for him. So after seeing him in second place after the short program, I think he had a 10th place free skate finish, which evened out to fifth for him here. That was a really unfortunate drop for him. We were really looking forward to seeing what he would accomplish. But Fifth is still strong at Europeans, and he's still just a lovely skater, just this wasn't his day. You want to talk about a lovely skater who just didn't quite do enough to get the podium, but still made everybody's day? That is Denise Vasilievs. Denise clearly did not care about the jumps at this event, and it didn't matter whenever he would not land them or when he'd have these technical issues, because it never changed the vibe that he was throwing out on the ice, which was just a love of skating and love of that big audience. I agree with that. I do think that he cared about the jumps, especially him trying the quad and that he is not consistent with. But he landed one in the free. He landed the quad sal nicely. Yeah. Yeah. And it was pretty good. But I still feel like he wanted more out of this competition. However, it was never going to surpass him wanting to have a moment with the audience. For all that, he obviously was very well trained and was trying to put out enough to make that podium. He never seemed phased when he failed a jump. It was more, okay, I didn't do that. Oh, well. The subtle difference is I think he cared, but not enough to actually affect any performance or his mood because his mood very much just seemed like I skated great. Okay, the jump sucked, but the skates... They were beautiful. It never killed his vibe. Never, ever. I think for Denise, the notable events going to come down for him was actually his gala performance because it was fantastic. It was an evolution of one that we saw him do uh, earlier this season, I think, at one of the Grand Prix galas, because I think the last time we saw him do it, I don't think he did any jumps in it. And here's the thing that I want to mention about the gala. They had a live orchestra playing with the recorded music here because, again, Lithuania decided to flex on the rest of the world (laughs) by showing how to actually put on an incredible skating event. So they have a live orchestra playing along with that music with his In the Air Tonight gala skate, and it's sublime. It is a beautiful piece, a nuanced bit of storytelling with a lot of emotion and a lot of dance quality. And it really shows you where Denise shines the most. And he was, for me, one of the highlights of the gala. Just beautifully executed program. I feel like Denise was one of the highlights of the event overall. Every skate he did had more emotion, more feeling, more intention than most. But I agree. His gala program especially was just where you want to see Denise. You mentioned solo ice dance. If there was someone in my heart that I'm like, please... If solo ice dance becomes a thing, I want to see Denise Vasilyev's move towards that because, my goodness, this man, so much emotion and art to share. Outside of the top six, I think one of the stories going into this through the latter half of this season has been the decline of Kevin Amos from France. We saw him completely melt down at the Grand Prix final, and then we saw him have disastrous skates at the French nationals. We were really hoping that he would come in here and deliver a redemptive skate. He didn't have to win. He didn't have to be really high up. He just needed to do good skates. And my understanding was, is that his coach didn't even want him to come to this event. They really wanted him to step away from it and recalibrate, but Kevin wanted to be here. 
But what happened on the ice was a shockingly bad short program that showed him not only popping jumps, but bailing out of spins and just giving up on the program. And it was such a poor performance that he failed to make the free skate, which this is one of the best men in the world most of the time. And he washed out of the free skate and didn't qualify there. And that just really makes you wonder what's going on with this skater and question, is he going to go to Worlds? All of these things. It was just really difficult to watch. Yeah. I mean, it was immensely disappointing. I did see today, actually, that Kevin Amos posted on Instagram that he was grateful for all of the support that he'd received after the event. It's hard to like outline. I would recommend just going and reading it. But the overall sentiment was that he doesn't want to be ashamed of himself anymore and that he's basically going to prioritize his mental health right now. So my interpretation of that is we're probably not going to see him at Worlds and he's going to take a beat. I think that's a, a very, very smart plan. I'm really hoping he can come back from this, but I 100 percent don't believe that's happening by March for the Montreal Worlds. There's no way. This was three competitions in a row, and every one of them was worse. This particular short program, I don't know that I've ever seen a senior man at his level have this big of a meltdown. You could see that he was just emotionally gone. His body was there, his mind and his heart were not. There was such a dissociation happening that I'm like, he needs to go and figure this out. This is not on the ice anymore. This is him checking in with himself and hopefully getting some help. And getting some space, because I don't think that there is a path forward until he takes that step back. And it sounds like from reading his Instagram post that he's doing just that and just taking a moment to say, okay, what's going on with me? How can I be a happier person, not only in sport, but in life? I'm really happy to hear that he's addressing that because that kind of performance, especially from such an emotional, artistic skater like Kevin It just left me really worried about him as a person. So to know that he's addressing that and saying, like, I recognize that this is more than the athleticism. This is just about me and I need to work on me. We always hate to see our favorites step away from the sport for any reason. But at the same time, prioritizing your mental health, prioritizing your ability to just live your life and do it in a healthy fashion is so much more important than medals or placements or fans or any of those things. So I'm glad to hear that. I hope that he makes positive changes. Again, here's a skater I would happily see make that jump to solo ice dance because I think having skaters like him in that realm where they didn't have to worry about jumps and could focus on what they do best artistry could really elevate that discipline. But more than anything, I just want to see a healthy Kevin Amos return to the ice when he's ready And when he's happy on the ice, when he wants to be doing what he's doing, because it really didn't look like he wanted to be doing that here. No, sending absolutely all of the good vibes to Kevin Amos. Well, let's move on to a happier story. The women's competition, where I was ecstatic to see Luna Hendricks finally get her European crown. A lot of this shook out the way that we expected to. We really expected Luna Hendricks, Anastasia Gubanova, Nina Pizzarone to all be in or around the podium. I know that uh, we were really looking for a better performance from Kimi Rapond. Didn't work out so well, but she was still coming back from injury. So she's a lower down one than we would have liked to have seen in here. There were also some surprise come ups here. Some people who landed in places that we would not have expected going into this. But the top three performances here were wonderful. And in particular, we got a return to form from Luna after a few skates this season where you could see that she was tired, where she was maybe dealing with injury or illness. And we weren't seeing the full version of Luna on display. And what we got here were two performances where she was at that best and brightest. We had the full Luna Hendricks experience here, which was what we desired most of the season. Her free skate had like a couple of minor bobbles. She left a few points on the table, a few deductions here and there. But her overall performance value, so much higher. Her speed, her commitment, her spins, all of them looked so much more on point with what we've come to expect from Luna. And her coming through at Europeans, especially after the disappointment of coming in as the favorite last year, 
and losing to Gabanova, I was just thrilled for her to finally get that moment that I feel like a lot of people in that crowd also were kind of hoping for. You could sort of feel the, oh, yes, Luna's finally now the European champion. We've been waiting for a while. When she came out for her short program, I was so pleased because you felt her confidence and that particular Luna Hendricks swagger was on display that we had not seen for a couple of competitions. She really won the crowd over that energy, that charisma that she has was just on full display. She just gave a great champion performance. We've talked a lot about this season about how like Kari Sakamoto has been looking like a champion every time she takes the ice. And here, this felt like a confident athlete, aware of her own abilities and knowing that she was most competing with herself, that the podium was hers as long as she skated up to her own standards. And that's what she did here. Absolutely. But certainly don't want to discount Anastasia Gubanova's performances here because it is absolutely the best we've seen her all season. Her short program, I actually think, is her best program I've seen from her, period. It's much more slinky and has attitude, and it feels like this is more of who she actually is, which is fun to see. It's exciting to see. But her free skate had the highest technical score of anyone at this competition, was clean, lovely, and really consistent, which is something that she has not been throughout this season. If I had any notes for her, and I think you're going to probably have a comment on this as well, it's the transitional content going into her jumps, which is almost non-existent. For as beautiful as a skater as she is, her jumps often are just sort of a straight line into a jump or one edge into a jump. There's no complicated movement, choreography, or just entries into her jumps which may be why she was as consistent as she was. I agree that that short program, I, that had me vibing. I was like totally feeling it. There's a lot of sass to it. Her cell in that program is wonderful. The beauty, classic beauty of that free skate is also just so well delivered. But there's a thing that we've talked about over and over again whenever we watch Gabanova's performances is that She's a hot or cold skater in that when things are going well, she's lovely. But as soon as she makes a mistake, she can throw away an entire program because you'll just see her disconnect. You'll see her become very robotic and just a paint by numbers performance with no emotional investment. And so she can throw away competitions whenever something goes wrong. She doesn't quite have that fight. I'm guessing that her team made the decision to give her transitions the least amount of technical effort going into them because it was really, really important for her to skate clean to maintain her presence on the ice. If she had fallen even one time, it could have wrecked her program. So it made more sense to water down those transitional elements so that she could make clean jumps and then focus on the rest of the performance. It does flatten out the free skate sometimes when you do see those long lead ups to jumps. And it's one of those areas where Luna shines, where she's putting in so much other technical and artistic flair into the jump lead ups. But in the end, Gabanova was still wonderful and very well positioned for that silver medal here. This puts her in great position going into Worlds to be considered amongst like the top six in the world for sure, which is something she was last season. So it's nice to see her have that return to form and be the skater that we know she is absolutely capable of being. In third, however, we're continuing to see that rise of Nina Pinzarone. Nina here is everything we thought she could be. She is a very well-balanced skater between her technical and her artistic ability. She's very consistent. I think that she could have walked away with the silver here, except for in that free skate, she got called on four different quarter rotations. And when she got off the ice, the score box reflected a big tech score. But once the review panel took a look at it, they really wore that number down until she ended up in that third position. I still think it's kind of deserved. I think that looking at her skate versus uh, Gabanova, Gabanova is just a veteran skater that had just a more refined performance there. But Bean Cerrone has so much talent. You know, she's only 17. There's a lot of career for her to turn into a major competitor. And I really think that it's going through the next couple of seasons where people are going to have to really worry about her 
even people like, say, America's Isabeau Levito is going to need to be watching over her shoulder for the rise of Pinceroni because she is a real threat this season and beyond in the women's division. Could not agree with that more. What I think is interesting, though, is looking at our four through six positions here. These are relatively new names in the mix for Europeans and just the international competition, which was fun. Yeah, I mean, the fourth place position, Livia Kaiser from Switzerland, this isn't even a skater I knew. I was not familiar with her. You know, we think of a Swiss woman in skating and it's Kimi Rapond, who didn't have her best competition here coming off injury. So Livia is the second ranked Swiss skater who ended up fourth at Europeans. What a day for Switzerland here. I think that her artistic skating still has a very junior quality to it. But she's technically very sound. She had a great music choice. Uh, the choreography was a bit awkward in places. There was these weird empty moments with odd movements that I didn't love in the free skate. But she's still just very solid, very promising. This was a season's best for her. And I kind of felt it was maybe just a tad overscored versus some of the other programs that we saw. But still, uh, Livia did a, a great job and seeing her land here. I mean, that's a big move for her. She has lovely line and a lot of potential to grow. I did see something kind of fun was that one of her programs was apparently to a song that Rachel Zegler, um, the actress, sings in a film. And Rachel Zegler like shared her performance and was just like overwhelmed by it. I think her words were, you know, something this beautiful is being performed to my voice. That's something really cool for this young Swiss skater to have the person that's singing the song is tweeting about her always kind of like warms my heart like oh that's so cool it's like a little extra fun acknowledgement i love that in fifth position we see uh lorraine shield from france land here lorraine is having an interesting season she's she's still a fairly young skater she just won french nationals very soft competition but she did a fine job there and, and took the podium there going into this i think a top 10 finish would have been ideal for her a fifth place finish, I think, was a big surprise considering the, the competition that was here. And she did that without even getting a season's best. She put on very nice, mature performances. There's a lot of really pretty elements. There's some wonky stuff in there and places that things could be improved. But notably, her free skate was choreographed by Gabby Papadakis. I mean, that's a nice element. That's uh, a bit of a flex. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> Seeing her come in here, this was her first Europeans, too. Yeah. She's not competed at this event before. So to walk away with a fifth place finish as somebody that didn't have a lot of heat behind her, other than winning her own national competition, kind of a big deal for her. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I was really excited for her, but also excited for Serena Juice, who we briefly mentioned on the preview episode that we've been hearing some buzz about but hadn't seen skate yet. She landed in six here with two really nice performances, particularly her free skate. Her short had some errors, but her free skate was great. Potential with a capital P on her. So it's interesting, especially as we're now two years into the quadrennial for the Olympics that's going to be in Italy for the Italians to show up so strong here, including her. Oh, yeah. The Italians had a great competition overall. Yeah, Serena, very competent skater, very strong. She has lovely carriage. I mean, she's so smooth on the ice. Very nice positions. She's definitely got some under rotations. She's not as artistically dramatic as, say, like a Kimi Rapond. Um, there are still places for that to grow. But again, just clean, smooth, competent. And for our first time seeing her, it was pretty impressive. Not to also you know, have a downer here, similar to Kevin Amos, not nearly as bad, but Ekaterina Kurakova, who was fourth at Europeans last year, had a rough short program here, rough enough that she did not make the free skate, which I'm a little shocked by still. I think everybody was shocked by that. We love Katya. She's very entertaining. She's one of the most charismatic, likable, bright personalities on the ice. She's always a crowd favorite. She always ends up in the gala no matter how she does because everybody always wants to see what she'll do next because she just wins every audience she's in front of. She's had a struggle this season trying to elevate the drama and maturity of her programs. Her short program to the Kill Bill soundtrack just did not seem to be winning the judges. She had compensated for that by changing out to a new short program going into this event. She had done it earlier in the, this season as well at Four Nationals. She had unveiled this new short program there. 
What we saw here was certainly a short program that was full of mistakes and plagued by some of the little problems that Kurakova has, like not quite perfect extensions and little elements that don't quite deliver. But we use the phrase death by a thousand cuts a lot on this show when we talk about how people can get whittled down by the technical panel and by reviews. But they were merciless with Kurakova to the point where it almost felt like an assassination. It was definitely weird. Like, yes, her combination was just a fail. Her first jump was supposed to be her combination. She didn't do the second jump. So she had to turn that second jumping pass into the combination. And it was a double, a triple that and then fell on the triple. I give her big props for having actually even attempted the triple after that double because, I mean, she was obviously off axis and wasn't going to land well by any stretch. So that showed her fight and the fall was just it was going to happen in the technical side. That is a big fail overall. But that said, while there was issues with a whole bunch of elements throughout this program, in looking at a lot of the people that scored higher than her, especially towards that bottom group that would have at least got her into the final program, I'm really confused as to why she dropped low enough to not even make it. Not saying she should have been even in the top 20, but her being 25th and out was a shock. I think the insult to injury was that she got a a negative one deduction for time violation, which is that she finished just after her music ended and you get one second to carry over. This is one of those violations that always feels a little arbitrary, not in the sense that it's arbitrary from if you look at the clock, you get one second, right? Somebody's timing for it, but it doesn't always get called. There are times where we've seen people blatantly blow it and not get a call on it. And other times where people have just barely crossed that line and gotten the deduction. And it always just feels like whoever the referee is, is how big a stickler they are in that moment. And here, that one point deduction that she got hit with there is what dropped her into 25th. It's tough because this is a skater who can never seem to please the judges, even though that, you know, she is such a fan favorite. We saw her at the last Olympics do the thing where she was in a very poor position after the short program and then rise dramatically in the free skate because she was so much better than a lot of the competition. There were a lot of less complete skaters than her that made it into that free skate. I don't love that as a fan of hers. It makes me unhappy, but it really did feel like the judges were savage with her. This was a very critical judging panel, though. They were fairly merciless to everybody as far as picking apart every under rotation or cue or edge call or whatever. But her in particular just got hit with all of them and it just felt personal. Yeah, it it did. And she was not invited to the gala here, which I mean, when you don't make the free skate, it makes sense. But in general, I'm looking forward to seeing her at Worlds and hope that that is a better day for her. Well, let's finish this up with pairs, which was, I don't even know if surprise is the right word. I mean, it was like, toss a bunch of teams up in the air and wherever they may land, there's your medals. (laughs) Wild. That sounds dismissive, but it was a great competition. Oh, I don't mean it as dismissive. It was just that random because everyone was so kind of evenly matched. Yeah. So I think a lot of the surprises here, when we were talking about this in the preview episode, our expectation would have been to see Hassan Veloden from Germany back on top of the podium. They land in fifth here. They did not have great skates for their quality and how great they have been this whole season. They underperformed and it just did not go as well as any of us or they would have wanted it to. Also, you know, you saw the Italian team of Sara Conti and Nicola Macchi, who were reigning European champions, as well as the reigning world bronze medalists underperform here after a season where they've been underperforming and underwhelming. They were looking better after the Grand Prix final, but they did not succeed here. But the real story for Italy is just the massive rise of two of their other teams who both podiumed here, including the team we refer to affectionately as Kitty Paws, which we took from the run through yeah, from Ashley Wagner, because that's the way she and Adam Rapon often refer to them because of their free skate to the cat, cat soundtrack. soundtrack yeah. um, but Lucrezia Bacari and Matteo Gracie landed at the top of the podium here and they were fabulous. They were absolutely wonderful. I admit every time the Cats program music starts, I kind of have that like groan internally like, oh, no, it's a Cats program. That's right. But I get over it pretty fast because they are extremely talented. 
they've come together as a team so quickly, very similarly to Haas and Veloden, who have not been together that long. This team just gelled really fast. And admittedly, whenever I first saw them and there's such an age gap between them, it definitely was that like, how is this going to work? And they're very balanced. She's an exceptional partner in the sense like she has fantastic extension and poise on the ice. I am very impressed with her, but they just killed it. Very similar to Matteo Rizzo, I actually felt their joy going into their free skate. Yeah. It was just like they were just happy to be there. And yeah. it turns out that was enough to get them a gold medal. <laughs> when we first saw Bakari and Guarosi on the Grand Prix this season, my first thought was that, you know, this is a team that, that has a lot of rough edges and is just kind of finding their footing together. They did feel a little unbalanced to begin with. And I just sort of felt like Matteo did not like the Cats program the first time <laughs> we saw them perform it. But every time we see them on the ice, they get better. Every time they feel more cohesive, they feel like they have found their rhythm together. They're gorgeous in the gala program, too. They just really have evolved so swiftly. It just works now. And also, that dude is such a hype man, seeing him <laughs> just rev up crowds and how playful he is. Their post-win interview where he thanked the crowd and the other competitors and stuff. He was just so generous and warm to everybody else involved. It was just wonderful to see. And I, I just, I'm really excited about him. And they really won me over. In second place, and we totally missed talking wow, about them. Wow, we screwed this one up. Yeah, yeah missed the, talking about them in our preview. And they are going to be threats for a while in pairs. The Georgian team of Anastasia Metokina and Luka Burlava. I'm sorry if I butchered those names. Somebody pointed out in the comments from our last preview episode uh, that we had forgot about this team. And it's not even so much forgot about it. They just weren't on our radar at all. We had seen them perform at the Grand Prix final gala because they had won juniors there. And we thought of them as a juniors team. We were not really aware of the fact that Luca has been a significant seniors performer in previous seasons. Was at the Beijing Olympics. Right. Yeah. There's so many competitors and internationally, there's so much to focus on. And especially over the course of us doing this show over the last like year and a half, it's changed the way we look at things. We've never been super U.S. centric in our fandoms, but certainly as a U.S. based couple and fans, a lot of our focus has been on what we could see here in the States. As we hunt down more of it and see more of this stuff, we do become aware that there's a lot of the international competitors that have been blind spots for us. And this is one of those cases where, you know, it was pointed out to us that they're basically a juniors team in name only. I don't know what they were doing in juniors at all. It seems kind of weird since they have both previously been with other partners competing on the senior level. Anyway, they came into this competition like a wrecking ball. They won the short program and they really looked like they were going to take the podium. Yes, they looked like they were absolutely set up to take gold. And in the free skate just had some unexpected problems. Still, they might have landed fifth in the free skate, I believe, but still ended up with the silver medal because of how well they did in the short program. This team is fast, dynamic, has potential with the capital P. I don't even know if that counts because I think they're beyond potential. I think that they're going to be medal threats for the world podium this year, for sure. They were outstanding to watch. I feel like they have a lot of room for growth in terms of their expression with each other. Like, they're both gorgeous skaters. But I would like to see more connection between them. I didn't really feel much of that. Regardless, they're a relatively young team. They haven't been together that long. I think that they could soar. Yeah. In their short program, I would have sworn that that team had been skating together for 10 years because their body language was so spot on and identical, like all of the time. It didn't look that same way in the free skate, but their air positions are inventive and spectacular. She's great in the air. She definitely had a few struggles there and didn't end up pulling them out of the top of the podium, but they were terrific. And yeah, they're a definite threat. I do think, though, that of all the teams we watched, my favorite, again, with the bronze medalists. Um, <laughs> it's a trend. It is a trend. Rebecca Gallarde and Filippo Ambrosini. I really like this team. They give me warm, fuzzy vibes. I don't know why, whenever they're skating to a vampire program um, and they're a free skate. Um, but there is something about them that I just really enjoy. They feel mature, connected. And overall, I was just thrilled that they made their second European podium again, like back to back. Yeah, their free skate here, it showed so much refinement. It's full of so many intricate details, so much presence, drama. It's really fast in the last third. Like they really pick up speed. 
it was beautiful. Like you said, I mean, in the pairs, their free skate is probably my favorite. And it jumped them from like fifth to the third position. And it was gorgeous. So this is a really, really great podium. And the takeaway that I have from this is just thinking about how this whole season it has felt like pairs was really Deanna Stellato Dudek and Maxine Deschamps at the top and everybody fighting for the rest of the podium, thinking ahead to Worlds, you know? Especially since we have not seen the Japanese pair of Riku and Ryuchi, like who, you know, are some of our favorites and who I would think of as your top contenders. But Stellato Dudek and Deschamps have had a few struggles in the last few competitions. And then you look at the top three here and you're like, oh, this game feels like it changed significantly just looking at, at the performances here. Yeah. I mean, if you look at their overall cumulative scores, they're still well behind the best scores that Deanna and Max have this season. But to your point, Deanna and Max have also had questionable consistency later in the season. Don't get me wrong. I love them. And if I'm being honest with our audience, I want them to win Worlds. But at the same time, I agree with you. I feel like while the scores here might not be as high, we're only seeing continued growth and acceleration from all three teams that were on this podium. So I think it might be tighter once we get to world championships than we might have thought when we were starting the season. The other uh, team I think that it's worth mentioning here is the fourth spot with the Hungarians, Maria Pavlova and Alexei Sviavchenko. This team is a lot of fun. They've done really well this season. You could tell they were disappointed with their scores after the free skate. And to be honest, what we saw there was uh, a lot of technical proficiency, but not a lot of artistic refinement. This team has the skills. They just need to work on the drama, the cell, bringing something more than the hops and the big explosive elements. They're a fun team. They're a young team. I think there's a lot of growth potential there. I think they were definitely outclassed here. This podium was tight. There's three points between first and second, a point uh, or less between second and third. And the Hungarians were very close behind that. But I think that when you watch their free skate versus the free skate from the third place Italians, it's no contest. The Italians just absolutely demolished them. A team that's worth watching horrific gala um I, I really want them to do something different that austin powers routine is is so cringy i i want to love them but i really don't want to see that program again I, i'll admit like this gala i highly recommend if it's still on peacock and streaming and you have access to peacock or or if you can watch it on the isu feed it's extraordinary they even had fire dancers at the end on the ice with the skaters i mean it was a show they brought the production value that said, several skippable kind of cringy programs, that one being definitely high on the list of like, as soon as they showed up in their Austin Powers, I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I can't. I love them as a team. I think they are fantastic. For some reason, that one just hits me and I'm just like, I can't do it. It's like when I hear Mambo Italiano anywhere, I'm like, no. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, Giardi and Br Brosini did not do that program here. No, they have a new gal, and it was very saucy, and I liked it. Definitely. They, they went for something a little bit sexier and a little bit more vibey, and I was really into that one. It was good. The only other uh, Paris team that I just want to hit here really quickly, they did not uh, make it into the free skate because they withdrew after their short program, the French team of Kovalev and Kovalev. This is a team that definitely has consistency issues. They're not necessarily one of the most competitive teams out there, but they had a horrendous fall where Camilla dropped onto her chest hard onto the ice. They completed the skate afterwards, but she was in agony and she had to be helped off the boards afterwards because she was in so much pain. You got to give respect to her to have taken the hit as hard as she did and then still go for the jumps, even though she didn't land them well or at all afterwards. She still fought to the end of that program so they could finish that short program, even though she was clearly miserable. I felt awful for her after. It's a hard thing to watch where you can see that she's in so much pain. Afterwards, I think they didn't get cleared to hit the ice again. She was not physically capable of it. I think she was already kind of struggling with something, whether it was illness. I think she was sick. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel awful for that team. I just want to throw out huge respect for her for just finishing that program after a fall that hard. And I hope that they recover well and that they'll be ready to show up at Worlds because I think they qualified for the free skate, but they just couldn't compete in it because of that. So hoping that she's feeling better. Well, I think we have probably talked enough, except I do want to end this with our goal in our heart segment. 
Did I do it as well as you do? I don't think I did. Gold in our hearts. Yeah, you do that better. <laughs> <laughs> this is a challenging one. Normally, we don't talk ahead of time about what this is going to be. We like to surprise each other here, but we did talk through it a little bit. Because this is our show and we make the rules, we're going to screw with them a little bit here, I think. <laughs> Up until the point before the Ice Dance final, I would have told you that the Gold in My Heart performance would have been Mateo Rizzo's free skate or just overall performance, his bronze medal in the men's. And I may still hold on to that as gold in my heart because I think I will give platinum in my heart to Allison Reed and Salius Embrolivicus for their performances in the ice dance competition. Those are once in a lifetime skates, not just because of the performances they put on, but for the audience and the energy they gave and the huge event moment that that created them winning the bronze there it was seeing the president of their federation crying in the box in celebration in happiness to see them secure a podium place and hearing that place go crazy that for me is a moment i just i just want to share with everybody because it's glorious so yes they're platinum in my heart i like that a lot but if we're breaking the rules gold in my heart is not a skater it's actually the audience the lithuanian people they brought such joy and excitement, enthusiasm in a country that is not known to be that big into figure skating. You would not know that watching this competition in any way, shape or form. They were generous, warm, supportive. And I haven't seen anything like that in a really long time in watching this sport. And I was grateful in watching the skaters eyes dancing around, looking at these people and seeing the enthusiasm and seeing that support. And you could see how much it meant to them. So yes, Lithuanian people, you are gold in my heart for making me feel like maybe figure skating is going to be okay after all, because apparently if it all happens in Lithuania, it's great. They absolutely must secure a Grand Prix event or other significant international event into this next year because they've proven that they can do it technically. They've proven that the audience comes out for it. And every skater at that event said, oh, my God, please send me here again, because this was the best experience in a time period where it's hard to watch the sport, where it's challenging to fill venues. And when we talk about Canadians in our next episode, you know, we'll look at it at a completely different event where like almost nobody showed up because of the circumstances of it. This event is going to go down as one of the marquee things that happened this season beyond beautiful performances. It was the feel good event of this season, if you will. So that's a wonderful choice. I yeah. think so, too. Yeah. So to wrap up here, incredible event. This was well beyond my expectations. I did not at all imagine that Europeans was going to be like a year highlight event. I had no idea this was. Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about the fact that the gala had a special guest and it was Gabby Papadakis and Guillaume Cicero. Like you also have the reigning Olympic ice dance champions just kind of showing up and performing some art on the ice absolutely spectacular yeah definitely one for the memory book and really hope that this sets the stage for a lot more things to come and that the ripple effect of such a great event can carry over into the rest of the sport proper but in our next episode like i said we're going to be talking about canadian nationals that will probably be a much shorter episode some of our predictions came true for that one uh, a couple of them were wildly off but we had some big surprises with that too so uh, stick around with us to hear that Scoreography is available on our website at scoreography.show, and you can find all the places to subscribe and listen or listen right there on the website as well. Our primary hub really is YouTube, and that's a great place to engage with us in the comments. So if you're listening to us on YouTube, please hop in and tell us what were your favorite skates? What was gold in your heart? What were your big surprises and takeaways from this event? And how does this affect your thoughts towards worlds? With all of that in mind, for Scoreography, I'm Adrian Buskey. And I'm Wendy Buskey. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.